What's up Beyonders, James here, coming back at you with another video. I just came home from the gym, just chasing those Megatron gains. It's like, I'm just messing. As you can tell from the title, we are back with Void Rivals, and this is long, long overdue. Now, there are three reasons why this video is going to be amazing. So, reason number one, Autobot Springer will appear and meet the Void Rivals. Reason number two, we're going to meet one of the deadliest warriors in the Energon universe. And finally, reason number three, remember the last video of Void Rivals I did where I theorized Transformers and Void Rivals origins could be connected in the Energon universe through the Quintessons? That gets confirmed here. And it all has to do with who Zerta Trion is. Now with all that out of the way, let's get into it. All right, so we begin our journey back into Void Rivals with a flashback of 10 years ago to when Darak worked as an edge walker. Now these mech suits immediately remind me of the APU suits in the Matrix movies. Darak is helping with some construction projects at the edge of Agoria near the wasteland that he and Solila are presently at. A stack of crates falls over and almost crushes a fellow worker in an edge walker until Darak jumps with his edge walker to push him out of the way. Now because of the intense gravity at Agoria's edge, he can't stop his edge walker's momentum. He does his best to resist the fierce gravity and hold on with his edge walker, but it's no good. He is thrown over Agoria's edge into the middle of the wasteland. His arm damaged and edge walker is out of commission. Which brings us to the present, with Derek leading Solila to the middle of the wasteland and revealing to her that he's been here before. Android informs them that the quickest path across the wasteland would take three months, but their supplies won't last that long. Derek tells Solila that they only need to make it roughly halfway and assures her there's a place that they're going to that she wouldn't believe even if he told her. As that's happening, back in Zertonia, Premier Zalilac meets with one of the deadliest warriors in the Energon universe, Proximus. And by the end of this video, you guys will learn why that's the case. Zalilac asks him to travel across the wasteland and hunt down an Agorian who's corrupted a Zertonian warrior. Now notice he doesn't reveal to him who exactly they are. He's trying to hold back as many details as possible. Proximus makes it clear though that he can't be easily manipulated. When Zalilac asks him for his price for taking this mission, Proximus senses the panic in Zalilac's voice. He reveals to him that he has read the sacred text and knows that he is haunted by the threat of the coming of Golian. And that's the only reason why he is here asking for his help. Now Proximus accepts the mission only because he also wishes to prevent the coming of Golian. However, he poses the question to Zalilac, what if I turn on you after I complete my mission? Zalilac answers, our last confrontation was unpleasant for both of us. Plus, you seem to have become happy and enjoy your time here. Besides, in your current state, what would freedom afford you? What's crazy here is that this entire conversation occurred in Proximus's mind. In reality, the current state of Proximus Zalilek is referring to is his body is mostly destroyed, but he's being kept alive in a healing tank where Zalilek keeps him. He seems to become more machine than Zertonian. The guy is basically Darth Vader, and what makes that even more the case is that once they remove him from the tank, he is clad in cybernetic armor to fill in his missing body parts and limbs, and he looks menacing. I love it. This guy's reputation as being dangerous is so crazy that once he leaves, Gulan, the guy with Zalilac here, falls to his knees in fear and says, Zerta, save us. Zalilac tells him to pull himself together and says he is a man even though he admits he is the deadliest of them all. Returning to Solila and Derek, Solila asks Derek more about his vision from Zerta. He answers that he's already told her everything. Handroid chimes in and guesses it was just a hallucination or dream caused by the jump jet. But Solila doesn't believe that. In her mind, that was the cause of their entire journey. And she tells Derek Zerta chose him. 
Remember, Zerta is a goddess Zertonians believe in, not a Gorian's. So Derek is still skeptical about believing in some goddess, despite the vision he experienced. Meanwhile, back in Zertonia, Mistress Vil summons all the Keepers of Light and informs them Solila is on the path of her calling, and her destination draws near. Man, the revelation that's coming is going to blow your minds. Oh man. From here we go to a flashback of when Solila was a little girl with her younger brother Polada. She's helping him put on his armor as he cries. We learn through their conversation that their mother sold them to Zertonia to be warriors. When Polada asks Solila does she think their mother ever loved them, Solila answers, I think Zertonia needed warriors and she needed food, but I think she did. When Polada begins to cry again and says that he's scared and wants to go home, Solila pushes him to be strong because the Zertonians will look for weakness. Polada becomes enraged and fights back, and they start exchanging blows with their spears and shields. So I think because Kirkman is showing us this flashback, and because of something we'll see soon in the video, I believe Proximus is Solila's brother Polada. In the present day, Solila asks Derek about the midway point to their destination. Derek answers that his memory is hazy but assures her it's an oasis with supplies and maybe a ride to take them to the Agorian border. Suddenly they hear whistling, and at that moment an energy arrow lands right in front of them and explodes, knocking them back. Proximus appears in front of them and says, for the good of the sacred ring, you both must die. So Lila tells Derek they won't survive because this is Proximus, the deadliest Zertonian warrior. Handroid warns Derek that his blaster is not going to have any effect on his dense armor. Derek ignores them and fires at Proximus, who quickly gets in close and whacks him with his bow. So Lila tells him to leave, and if she manages to escape, she'll find him. Derek refuses because in his words, heroes don't run away. He jumps right back into the fight, and Proximus hits him so hard that he becomes unconscious. I thought this was pretty funny. Proximus stops and stares at Solila and asks, do I recognize you? And she answers, if only you could. That response right there is why I believe Proximus is Polata. Proximus fires one of his arrows and Solila dodges it. Just like how Solila can manipulate her spear, it seems Proximus can manipulate his arrows because the arrow follows Solila until it hits her. It's like Yandu from Guardians, his uh, Yaka arrow. As Proximus gloats and closes in on Solila, Handroid fires Derek's blaster, distracting him long enough for Solila to launch her spear and impale Proximus. He kicks Derek's body, and when Solila tries to call her spear back to her, he keeps it in place. A solar windstorm begins to occur and sends Solila flying toward Proximus, who grabs her by the throat and starts choking her. Luckily for them, the windstorm quickly becomes more intense and blows them all away. However, that doesn't stop Proximus. He regains his footing in the middle of the storm, takes out Solila's spear, and hurls it in the storm. When the storm passes, Darak regains consciousness and asks Handroid to scan for Solila and Proximus. Handroid informs him that Proximus is nowhere near them or approaching and that Solila is nearby. He tracks her armor signature and Darak finds Solila bleeding out, impaled by her spear. Luckily, she's still alive because, as Handroid points out, her spear fused with her armor, so she isn't losing much blood. Solila ends up retracting her spear into her to stop the bleeding. Derek mentions the windstorm was a blessing because it got them away from Proximus and much closer to their destination. Sometime later, Solila collapses and Derek is forced to carry her the rest of the way. After some time, Handroid warns Derek he's pushing himself too much, but Derek assures him he can keep going. At that moment, Handroid detects Derek's Edgewalker exosuit he wore 10 years ago. They've made it to the Oasis, which is not much like an Oasis. We see it's an old shelter with scraps of different tech around it. They enter the shelter and Handroid checks Solila's vitals and informs Derek she's lost too much blood. Suddenly, the vehicle that was sitting in the shelter transforms, revealing to be Springer. He astutely points out that Derek isn't surprised to see him like other beings. 
He offers to help with Solila, but once he realizes they're organic beings, he's unsure of how he can help. Derek shows him Handroid and tells him that he can perform surgery, but needs tools and a sterile environment. Springer responds there aren't a lot of supplies. All of a sudden, they both hear a faint whistling, and Derek says, oh no. Then boom, an arrow lands between them and explodes, knocking Derek and Solila's unconscious body back. Derek yells to Springer, that guy is trying to kill us. And Springer is like, what guy? At that moment, Proximus attacks Springer. When Springer blocks the attack and sees he's small like Derek, he doesn't take him seriously. Proximus gets pissed and unloads a barrage of arrows at Springer. Springer whips out a freaking sword and says, I'd like to see you try that again. Springer with the sword is so badass. Proximus says, your size does not intimidate me. And Springer replies, funny, same. They go to war. Proximus dodges all of Springer's attacks and Springer admits that he will have to take him more seriously because he may have the size advantage, but Proximus has the speed advantage and he's landing blow after blow on him. Now, let's be honest, is it severe damage he's doing to Springer? No, not really. At least it doesn't seem like that's the case. If anything, this seems to be more like the equivalent of one of us dealing with, let's say, a hornet continuously stinging us as we're trying to swat it. However, Proximus is proving he can go toe to toe with the Transformer. And that becomes very clear here when Springer goes in for a killing blow, thrusting his sword toward Proximus, and Proximus is able to block and hold Springer's attack back. Even Springer is shocked by this, asking him how can he do that. Proximus deflects the blade and they begin the fight again. Meanwhile, Derek has Handroid check on Solila's vitals again, and Handroid tells him her condition has worsened. He can't detect her blood pressure and her pulse is fading. Derek checks her body and discovers the mysterious green key Mistress Vil gave her. I hate to do this to you all, but we must cut away from that madness and go to two different places for a moment. First, we go to Quintessa, home of the Quintessons. The Quintesson scientist has requested an audience with the judge to report his findings on Derek and Solila's makeshift ship the Skuxoid gave them. The scientist reports that the special alloy found in the ship has traces of a formula that dates back to ancient Cybertron. He says, we believe this Zertonia, the Skuxoid mentioned, could be connected to Zerta Trion. The judge responds by killing the scientist right on the spot, just electrocuting him until he's nothing but a smoking corpse. The judge says, speaking that name has long been forbidden. So Zerta or Zerta Trion is connected to the Quintessons, but that is just the beginning of the revelations in this video. The next place we go to is Zertoni again, where Premier Zelilek meets with Minister Doolin over hologram. Zelilek is pissed that Doolin summoned him like he's a servant. Doolin claps back with an interesting response that reveals to us how Premier Zelilek became ruler of Zertonia. He says, don't bark at me, usurper. My position was earned by blood right, not stolen. Before the argument escalates further, Doolin apologizes and reveals the reason why he called him here was to find out the status of Derek. Because remember, he gave Zelilek the okay to kill his son. Zelilek tells him he still lives. After he says this though, he immediately detects relief in Doolin and questions his resolve, asking him if he remembers what's at stake. Doolin responds by asking why his son's execution has not happened yet, and Zelilek answers, it's in process. Doolin quickly deduces that Derek and Solila have escaped. Zelilek abruptly ends the call, and we then see Doolin smiling. When we saw him give Zelilek the okay to kill his son, he seemed saddened, and now he's relieved when he finds out he still lives. So maybe he truly loves and cares for his son. Back in the wasteland, the fight continues between Springer and Proximus. Springer mentions that he's glad the Autobots aren't here to see him struggling to take Proximus down. Proximus responds that no one shall be here to mourn his death either. 
Springer transforms into his vehicle mode and runs over Proximus. As that's going on, Darak has Handroid inspect Solila's key. And Handroid reports it can't identify the key's origin. All it can report is that the key is very old. Suddenly, Solila comes to life momentarily and starts choking Darak, telling him not to touch the key. But as quickly as she springs to life, she returns to her unconscious state. After that exchange, Darak decides it's a good idea to put the key right back. Returning to Springer and Proximus' fight, Proximus fires an explosive arrow beneath Springer, sending him flying. Springer though, transforms mid-air, blasts Proximus, and stabs his body into the ground. He admits that he has never faced a worthy opponent that was so small. Though he wins the fight, that isn't the end of Proximus, because when Darak informs Springer that Solila's condition has worsened, Springer goes to secure Proximus and sees he's escaped and left behind only an arm and a leg. Springer takes Darak and Solila to his hidden underground lab, where we learn just how long Springer has been stranded in the wastelands. Darak asks how long this lab has been here. Springer answers he's built this lab in the last 100 years, using what was left of his crash shit. When Darak removes his helmet, Springer is shocked and asks him about the diamond on his forehead, which Derek calls his mind eye. I feel like this is the first time we actually get a name for it in this series. I can't remember if we've heard it before. If we have, comment it down below. Springer calls it an Energon port, and when he sees Solila has one as well, he tells Derek he can help. As Springer is healing Solila, her mind begins to awaken and is filled with Zerta speaking to her. Zerta says, it is time for you to awaken, my child. Zertonians, Agorians, all of you are sleeping. First, you will awaken, and then you will awaken the rest. The time of unity draws near. When Solila realizes it is Zerta speaking to her, she replies, I live to serve you. Your will is mine, as I have always promised. What will you have me do? Zerta answers, you're the strongest of my children, bestowed upon you a glorious quest, where you will venture into the depths of the sacred ring. There you will face a trial never asked of your kind before. You must find me. So Lila responds, how could I ever do that? I wouldn't even know where to begin. Zerta answers, my child, your journey already started long ago. The Agorian began it. The next step of your journey will undoubtedly be difficult, but I have already given you a key. At that moment, Solila is fully awakened and is glowing pink as Springer and Derek are shocked and stare at her. Springer tells her that it's Energon radiating out of her and will fade once her energy levels stabilize. Solila initially freaks out, asking Springer what he did, but Derek assures her he did nothing but save her life. This is where we learn the Zertonians and Agorians' connection to the Transformers. Springer says, Energon is a concentrated form of energy we Cybertronians use as food and fuel. Though your people, Zertonians and Agorians, are organic, their physiology, however, has elements of a synthetic nature that appear to be Cybertronian in origin, at least on a cellular level. Your world, the Sacred Ring, seems to be an engine that generates Energon and fuels it for a purpose that I have yet to discern. Derek reminds Solila of the name Cybertronian from their encounter with Jetfire. This is where we learn a bit about the origin of the Transformers. Springer explains to Solila and Derek that Cybertron is in shambles because of a civil war that's raged for eons and has left the planet drained of its resources. His people, the Autobots, are losing the war and they left the planet millions of years ago in search of new Energon resources in the hope that they could turn the tide. At one point, he heard a legend about a Cybertronian who broke away at the earliest point in their history after they gained independence from their creators. She rebelled against her brethren and set out to forge a new path. Her name was Zerta Tryon. So Lila asked what Tryon means. Springer answers that it is a title that denotes great wisdom and authority. Only two of my kind have earned its honor. 
So I think it's pretty safe to assume that Skybound is going with the origin of the Transformers in the G1 show where the Quintessons created them. However, where it seems to differ, instead of the Autobot A3 aka Alpha Trion being the one who led the rebellion against them, it was Zerta Trion. But I think we will learn Alpha Trion helped in that rebellion and that she was the first Trion and then passed on the title to him when she left to create Zertonia. That's my theory at least. The biggest question I'm left with though, is Zerta a Quintesson? Since Springer used the words, rebelled against her brethren. Everyone comment down below your thoughts on these big reveals. So Lila asked Springer to tell her everything he knows about Zerta Trion. However, suddenly, a rumbling from the surface interrupts them before he can say more. When they all go out to see the source of it, initially they believe it's Proximus, but discover it is much, much worse. Parmir Zalilak has become so desperate that he has sent an entire Zertonian squadron with tanks and blast wings after them. The Zertonian squadron fires on them. Springer grabs Darek and Solila, transforms into his helicopter mode to try to escape, but as he points out, the intense gravity prevents him from flying in that mode for long. So Lila mentions neither can the Zertonian Blastwings, which is why the squadron isn't using them. She drops down from the helicopter and takes the bite to the Zertonian soldiers, but does tell Springer and Derek to try their best to avoid harming the soldiers, because they're just doing what they were ordered to do. Derek doesn't have to worry about that, because he realizes his blaster is useless against the Zertonian soldiers' armor and then he finds himself staring down a tank, until Springer comes up and punts the tank. That gives Derek an idea. He runs away from the battlefield. Springer asks Olila if Derek is a coward because of this, but she answers and admits that is one thing he definitely isn't. Derek's idea was to get his old Edgewalker exosuit. He sees that it still works, and he comes running towards the battlefield and starts smashing through the troops. He ends up going to attack a tank, but the tank's armor is a lot stronger than the Edgewalker, so his attack fails. Springer comes up and stabs his sword through the tank. As the Zertonians begin to retreat, Darak does something that I truly didn't expect. He calls out to one of the soldiers running away. He asks Springer to take the soldier to his lap and explain everything about Energon to him and how they can use it, because the Zertonian people are struggling and starving. Springer does it, and so Lila asks Derek why he would give up his people's advantage. Derek answers, since we took off our helmets and learned the truth, I've started looking at things differently. Battling over that water-rich meteor was fine when we were enemies, but knowing your people not getting that water likely resulted in Zertonian deaths haunts me. We know we're the same, and that deep dark secret has both of our sides wanting us dead. They're not your lives or my lives anymore. They're just lives, and I want to save as many as I can. So Lila apologizes, but Derek assumes she still will hit him, but so Lila promises she will never do that again. At that moment, the Zertonian soldier runs past them and Springer tells them he's given him a data drive with all instructions they could possibly need. Later, as the Zertonian soldiers retreat to Zertonia, the soldier reviews the data drive. Suddenly, a hand comes out of the wasteland and grabs on to a Zertonian tank, which turns out to be Proximus. Back at Springer's lab, Derek asks him for his help in getting he and Solila to the Agorian border, and mentions after meeting Jetfire, he remembers Springer saving him the last time he was here at the shelter. Springer agrees and tells Derek he wants to hear more about his encounter with Jetfire. Derek then requests for a data drive to share with his own people. He then asks Salila about her green key, and at that moment Salila responds by pointing her spear at him. He reminds her of her promise, and she stops herself and says, I'm very sorry, but this is where we must part ways. And that's the end of Void Rivals. This was such a long video, but we're finally caught up with everything. Comment down below your thoughts on Zerta Tryon and Void Rivals being confirmed to be connected to the Transformers. Other than that, have an awesome day and always remember every day to go beyond.